Grace to you and peace from God our Father and from our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Amen. A sermon text this morning is our Old Testament lesson from Isaiah 45, verses 20 through 25, which we now hear again. Assemble yourselves and come. Draw near together, you survivors of the nations. They have no knowledge who carry about their wooden idols and keep on praying to a God that cannot save. Declare and present your case. Let them take counsel together. Who told this long ago? Who declared it of old? Was it not I, the Lord? And there is no God besides me, a righteous God and Savior. There is none besides me. Turn to me and be saved, all the ends of the earth. For I am God, and there is no other. By myself I have sworn. From my mouth has gone out in righteousness a word that shall not return. To me every knee shall bow, every tongue shall swear allegiance. Only in the Lord it shall be said of me, our righteousness and strength. To him shall come and be ashamed all who were incensed against him. In the Lord all the offspring of Israel shall be justified and shall glory. These are your words, Heavenly Father. Sanctify us by the truth. Your word is truth. Amen. The definition of idolatry is false worship. Literally, idolatry means to serve an idol. In its most crass, obvious form, idolatry is not a regular part of our lives. We don't have many friends or relatives who bow down and worship idols that they or someone else has carved out of wood. So on the surface, from our own life experiences, we might not think that these words from Isaiah are very relevant to us. But they are, because you would be hard-pressed to think of a more idolatrous age than the one in which we are living right now. Idolatry is the worship of creation instead of the creator. When our worship is directed towards God and is controlled by God, then it is God-pleasing. But when we try to control our worship, we will invariably end up in idolatry. When people are in charge, they make themselves and their own desires to be their gods. And that's really what idolatry is. It is not the worship of an object. Idolatry is the worship of yourself. So now we see that Isaiah's words here are very relevant to us. Because idolatry is not something that we primarily find outside of us. If you want to find idolatry, look right here because the human heart is the source of all of it. The reason why these verses, and others like them from the Old Testament, seem to no longer be relevant to us, is because our society has convinced itself that idolatry is fine. It's just another form of worship. I'm sure we've all heard the argument that everyone really worships the same God, just according to different names. That is a very popular opinion, as is its sibling. That regardless of faith, everyone who lives a good life according to their religion will end up in heaven. People claim that Christians and Muslims and Mormons and adherents of every world religion all worship their version of the same God and all believe essentially the same things. And from this first claim comes a second that the claim of a single objective truth, that there is only one true God and one true worship of God, is intolerant and negative. Because who are you to say that your way of believing and worshiping is better than someone else's? As long as someone faithfully follows Jesus or Buddha or Muhammad or whoever else, it doesn't really make a difference. After all, religion is religion or so the argument goes. Now, if religion was something that people have invented, that all might be true. If mankind is the author of true faith and true worship, then you could make the case that all religions are essentially the same. But we are not the inventors of our religion. We are not the authors of our worship, and we are not the source of all truth. 
God has spoken through his prophet. Who told this long ago? Who declared it of old? Was it not I, the Lord? For I am God, and there is no other. By myself I have sworn. From my mouth has gone out in righteousness a word that shall not return. Whatever God says is. He is able to speak with an authority that is far greater than anything we could possibly muster. When we want to make a point as strong as we can, we swear by God. So when God wants to make a point, he swears by himself, because there is nothing greater. Whatever God says is true, because God's word establishes the truth. God's word made this world on which we live to be true. God spoke it into existence and then gave it to us to live on and enjoy. But of course, mankind has not always thanked and worshipped God for this, but instead has worshipped that which God has made. That's what the ancient Israelites did. They adopted the pagan worship practices of their neighbors in the hope of having a good harvest or being able to act on all their sinful desires without also having to know that what they were doing was wrong. This had been why, when God brought his people to Canaan, he told them to clear the land before settling. God did not want his people to be tempted to worship made-up gods who couldn't hear their prayers and answer them. And for an example of this, we don't have to look any further than our gospel lesson today. The Canaanite woman who came to Jesus was a descendant of those whose false worship had lured God's people away from his true worship. But how much had the gods of her ancestors been able to help her and her daughter? Just about as much as you would expect. An idol imagined in the mind and then carved out of wood can't do anything, not for itself and not for anyone else. By coming to Jesus, this Canaanite woman was rejecting the religion of her own people, a religion made up by men for men, and she was embracing the true worship of the one true God. She looked to Jesus not just as someone who could help her with a temporary physical problem, but as the only one who could help her and her daughter in every way forever. So she definitely would not have said that all religions are the same. But still, many people do say this. Those who do not want to listen to God and don't want to feel bound to have to do what he says to do want God to be quiet. They want him to stop speaking to them and to everyone. Because as long as there are those who do believe in God and worship him and want to hear his word, well, those same ones will be speaking God's word. This is why those who do not themselves want to believe in and worship the true God also do not want you to believe in him. They don't want to hear his voice coming to them from any direction. They would much rather be able to live in the deluded peace of their idolatry. And for a time, they may feel this peace. Those who refuse to hear God's will, God's word, will, for a while, feel free from the demands of his law on their consciences. But this is not a true freedom, nor will it last. In the end, as Isaiah tells us, everyone will bow to God whether they want to or not. Every tongue will confess that God is Lord whether it wants to or not. In the end, when Jesus returns in glory to judge the earth, it will be clear that only in God and only from his word was there righteousness and strength. And all those who tried to silence God's voice as he spoke to them and to others in this life will endure the shame and judgment of their sins. This is the shameful end from which God has freed us through the gospel of the Son. St. Peter writes in his first epistle, Jesus committed no sin, neither was deceit found in his mouth. When he was reviled, he did not revile in return. When he suffered, he did not threaten, but continued entrusting himself to him who judges justly. He himself bore our sins in his body on the tree, that we might die to sin and live to righteousness. By his wounds you have been healed. 
Jesus came into the world as a man to undo all the unfaithfulness of mankind. He came to be faithful to God perfectly in every way, in his prayers, his worship, and his actions, so that having no sins of his own, he could bear your sins and pay for them on the cross. Jesus is the one of whom Isaiah wrote, and in whom he and all of God's people believed. Jesus is the fulfillment of God's promise to send a righteous Savior to whom people from all the nations of the earth can turn to be saved from their sins. It is true that only God has the right to command us in everything we do and say and think. As the one who has created all things and given life to us, God has the right to establish correct worship and prayer and living. But those who think that God only speaks demands on them aren't actually listening to God. Yes, God tells you you are a sinner. God tells you you were born a sinner. And he tells you that every single time you have violated his clearly given law is a time when you have earned for yourself his present and eternal judgment. But God also tells you just as clearly and just as truly that there is a way out of your sins. And that way is Jesus Christ. Instead of demanding that you pay for your sin by sacrificing yourself or your loved ones, God has sacrificed Himself, His only begotten Son, with whom He is pleased. And then, on the third day following this sacrifice which Jesus made in our place, he rose back to life. Jesus rising was when God justified him. He declared Jesus to be not guilty and obviously to not be deserving of death. This very same verdict and this very same promise of the resurrection is what God is shouting to you in the gospel. Turn to me and be saved. Not just some people, but all people. All the ends of the earth. There is no God besides me. There is no other source of righteousness and salvation than that which he has erected on the cross and declared from the empty tomb. This is what it means to have righteousness in the Lord. It doesn't mean that you have done righteous things. It simply means that you have been forgiven of all your sins through faith in Jesus. It means that the promise God made to the world in Christ, he has now kept in you by faith. Through faith, God doesn't see your sins anymore. He doesn't remember that you used to be someone who embraced idolatry. The righteousness of Christ has covered all of that up. When God looks at you now, all he sees is that righteousness. When God looks at you, he sees that you are someone with whom he has no problem. Someone whom he does and will love and take care of forever. Knowing this from God, that he has justified us freely by, by his grace. Who cares what anyone else might think? Let the world mock us for our religion. Let them call us ignorant or bigots or whatever. Because we believe and speak only the truth of God's word. And let the devil try as much as he wants to rob us of the peace of our consciences. Because he can't. No power in heaven or on earth, no thing seen or unseen, can take away the glory that we have in Jesus. This is not a glory that we have found or invented for ourselves. We have not met God on our own terms. He has found us. He sent his Son into our world to be our righteousness. And now he has declared that righteousness to us in his word and made it ours by faith. So as we wait for Jesus, we don't do so fearfully or even nervously. We have God's sure promise that all those whom he has made able to swear allegiance to him in this life, he is going to bring to enjoy all the glory of the life to come. Amen. Now may the peace of God, which surpasses all understanding, guard your hearts and minds in Christ Jesus our Lord.